Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this luncheon program. And over the course of the next several minutes, we'll have people coming in from the symposium. We started just a bit late, so we wanted to not cheat our panel and make sure that people got the opportunity to hear uh, the richness of their thoughts. So we ended a little bit later, so people will be coming in. We are honored to have you with us today to hear our featured keynote speaker, Mr. Taylor Branch. Now, if you have spent the morning with us at the symposium, I hope you found the discussion very thought-provoking, provo rich, and informative. I'd like to again thank our partner for this symposium, which is the University of Men Memphis, Cecil C. Humphreys School of Law. Can you give them a round of applause, please? Is President Rudd in the room by chance? He is not here, okay. All right, um, well, the, the university has been an incredible partner on this endeavor as we launched our 50th commemoration, and we're so appreciative of their willingness to participate with us. As we stated in this morning, events like these don't happen without committed friends and sponsors. Please look in your program and see our list of sponsors on page 15 of your program. But for today's lunch, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee is our presenting sponsor. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Dakasha Winton, Senior Vice President and Chief Government Relations Officer. Thank you for that introduction. Good afternoon. Let me get this together here because I'm a little short. Good afternoon. My name is Dakasha Winton, and it is my privilege to be here with you today to honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and to represent Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee. Dr. King's dream is a part of who I am. Like many of you, I was born right here in Memphis, Tennessee, and the experiences of our families before during and after the civil rights era have shaped who we are. For me, my grandfather, James Winton, who has been on a tour for the past year, by the way, was a Memphis sanitation worker, marching alongside the other sanitation workers and Dr. King for basic rights. And my grandmother, like many of the wives standing in the background behind the sanitation workers, but on her own business, was a maid. My grandparents instilled in their children, who instilled in their children, that no matter the circumstances, there is no excuse for not hard, working hard. So it is truly humbling to stand here before you, 50 years after the I Am A Man March, to say that I am a senior executive for a company that values and champions inclusion and has been recognized by Forbes magazine as one of America's top employers for diversity. My own journey would not be possible without the efforts and experiences of those who went before me. It is important to know that we should never lose sight of Dr. King's dream or the importance of celebrating our diversity and that we all hold that in common. Again, it's an honor for me to be here and to remember the life and legacy of Dr. King. Thank you all for joining us today. And now I'd like to introduce Patrick Daly and Roland Carter who will provide a musical performance. Oh, not yet? Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dakasha. I did not know that about your grandfather. So thank you for giving us that information. Patrick and Roland will come up after we have the invocation. So I'd like to ask Rabbi Micah Greenstein, senior rabbi at Temple Israel and member of our board of directors to provide us with our invocation. Eyes opened or closed, however you pray, let us pray. Lord, as we continue to part the waters at Canaan's edge, we remember what you told Moses through that pillar of fire known as the burning bush. You said in Exodus, take your shoes off, Moses, for the land on which you are standing is holy ground. 
Your prophet Martin, Lord, chose the ground of Memphis just as he chose Selma and Birmingham and everywhere hatred reigned. King understood that to reveal the good, Lord, we must first unveil the evil. He knew that the goodness and decency of humanity is best revealed through the power of nonviolent sanitation workers and little girls in Birmingham, attacked and assassinated by the enemies of decency. As the world gathers in Memphis to honor not the death, but the life and legacy of King. And in the presence of Taylor Branch, who has made that task his life's work, may the question Dr. King asked in the pouring rain 50 years ago tonight resound in our minds and hearts. The question King asked is not what will happen to me if I speak for the sanitation workers. The question is, if I do not speak, what will happen to them? Thank you, God, for the blessing and privilege of caring for the struggle for civil and human rights. Thank you for the food on our table. And as Dr. King would say, if he were here, may all who are hungry be blessed with food. And may we never be indifferent to the cries of those who remain impoverished. Please, God. Answer the prayers of all who turn to you in need and make us your helping hands on earth. We offer this luncheon, this MLK 50 commemoration, and every breath we take in your holy name, in the name of the God who loves us all. And let us say, amen. We are very, very thankful to, to FedEx for helping make this two-day symposium and tomorrow's commemoration a reality. And we also want to thank them for making the museum available at no charge to our museum guests yesterday. And the tally has come in, and the generosity of FedEx allowed us to provide entry for 3,587 guests yesterday. Of that number, 872 were children and 78 were college students. So you see somebody from FedEx say thank you. Now, please join me in welcoming Mr. Dave Bronzik, President and Chief Operating Officer for FedEx Corporation. Wow, this is amazing. Terry, you've done an amazing job as always. Thank you. Yes, give her a big round of applause. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great day. And I'm deeply honored to be here with all of you today as we commemorate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. Amazing. Today, I have the privilege to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, Taylor Branch. And now that I look over there, I hope Taylor is uh, here. He was sitting over here, is he? Uh, Taylor, of course, has written many books. You probably have written some of them. Uh, if not, you need to. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't call him out as being one of our uh, great alumni from the University of North Carolina. He's a Tar Heel, and I know the hides over here are Tar Heels. Taylor is also a Moorhead scholar uh, as is Barbara Hyde. And also, I wanted to say that um, with his many, many achievements and, and awards that he's received, I think the biggest, of course, is the Pulitzer Prize that he won in his narrative history of the civil rights era. And it's called America in the King Years. So not surprisingly, Taylor has a lot to say about Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I, however, have a few things to say. Dr. King's powerful message of fairness and inclusion to me has always been significantly important in my life. And I'll tell you why in a minute. In fact, it's led me to be an uh, ardent supporter of our fabulous National Civil Rights Museum here in Memphis, Tennessee, run by Terry. 
But throughout my career at FedEx, which has been decades and decades and decades and decades, actually hit 42 years with FedEx yesterday, if you can imagine. Yes, thank you. I think Fred Smith wouldn't be applauding right now. But I've had uh, the privilege of taking my family with me, uh, and they're the joy of my life, all around the world. Canada, we lived in Canada, we lived in Europe, we lived in the Middle East, and I've seen many times throughout my travels differences of people's culture, their diversity, their backgrounds, uh, their beliefs, and things that they view maybe differently than even I would view them. But nonetheless, I've had a lot of time to spend with them. So diversity and inclusion that I've seen around the rest of the world Quite frankly, I wish I could see it more in the United States. It's what, it's what Dr. King spent his entire life uh, fighting for. While we've come a long way, and I think you'd have to agree we have, we have a long way to go. We must ensure that it's woven into the fabric of our country. And I always tell my folks at FedEx, it's imbuing to die into the fabric, to stain in to the culture of our country. We must all play a very vital role in this, or it won't happen by itself. So through his extensive focus on Dr. King's life and legacy, Taylor Branch has paid an amazing tribute to both his story and, of course, to his humanity. I'd like for us all to give a very warm Memphis welcome to our keynote speaker, Taylor Branch. Thank you. Hello, Memphis. I'm happy to be here. I appreciate the introduction from David Bronfeck and FedEx. I did not fly in on a FedEx jet because um, I worry about Tom Hanks. Um, <clears throat> but that's a great movie and a great company. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank Terry Freeman and the National Civil Rights Museum and the University of Memphis for sponsoring this amazing event which would amaze a lot of people in America and certainly a lot of people around Dr. King's table in 1968. I'm humbled by your commission to offer reflections today on what the legacy of Dr. King's movement means for today. I think in short what I'm saying is that I think the legacy about Dr. King from Dr. King's movement is about our future if we are lucky to make it so and not about our past. Um, and that's because it goes so deeply to the principles that are either going to take us forward or that we will be lost. So I really want to try to convince you in a short amount of time by reviewing Dr. King's uh, career that we are poised on a precipice of whether or not we recover its principles which are essential to the well our well-being in the future. You're entitled to ask why me? Why, why a white southerner born in Atlanta who grew up in segregated Atlanta uh, is here talking to you about the legacy of Martin Luther King? It's a a fair question. I certainly was not meant to do that. I grew up uh, in a non-political family. My father was a dry cleaner in Atlanta. I was planning to be a surgeon. <clears throat> I didn't care about politics. Um, and it's the tenacity of the movement that changed the direction of my life's interests against my will because it lasted so long over a crucial period of my life. I was in first grade the year of the Brown decision. I was in beginning high school the year of the sit-ins um, and the Freedom Rides the next year. I finished high school the year of Freedom Summer and the 64 Civil Rights Act. And I, the spring of my senior year in college was the spring that Dr. King was murdered here in Memphis. So all through my formative year, years, this relentless movement was going on. And it took that long to really convert me. It was fearful when I was young. 
I remember the Atlanta Temple was bombed. That's the first political event I remember. And there were swastikas in the and uh, anti-black uh, song uh, slogans in the ruins of the Atlanta Temple in 1957, I believe. Um, the civil rights era was scary. It was scary to white people. It was scary to black people. If all of my thousands of interviews mean anything. Don't believe everybody who says that they were in the heart of the civil rights movement, because most black people weren't either. Um, it, was, it was a frightening time. I was amazed, but it started raising deep issues, even for me as a child, developing a sense of sarcasm about what was going on while I was chasing girls and playing football. Um, I remember that some of my friends who were who were hostile across the racial lines were the very ones that would sneak off to Hernan Stadium to hear what we called sanctified Ray Charles. Um, and we would go downtown to hear Jackie Wilson and Mary Wells and Sam Cooke. And there was something about the, magis the magic and the emotion of crossover black music in that era that deepened the mystery of where is this race thing coming from? Why is it that my friends court their girlfriends only to black music? Um, and Johnny Mathis was about as white as we got. Um, in that period. And, and we resented the fact that Ricky Nelson would cover Little Richard songs uh, and Pat Boone. Uh, we were wise enough to know that in that era and, and at the same time then the Freedom Rides come out. Where is this coming from? My city of Atlanta, by the time I was beginning to question things, how deep does this go? In a panic, the city of Atlanta adopted its motto. Atlanta, the city too busy to hate. I went to school the next day and asked the only professor that I had that was, could comment on that because he was telling me what a joke it was that our school was saying we weren't segregated, we just didn't have any qualified black applicants yet. Um, I asked him, what does this mean? It, it, th we are bragging about the fact that we're too busy to hate. Doesn't that mean that we have to stay busy so we won't have a natural inclination to hate? Because that's what we have. So if we are bragging that we're too busy to hate, what would we confess? Um, so we, we realized that race really flummoxed the elected leaders of Atlanta. By the, sum, by the spring of 1963, I told my mother that this race issue had been going on for nine years since the Brown decision. I'm a junior in high school. And I think that when I get really old and well-established, like 30, I, I'm going to stick a toe into this race issue because it seems to go really deep. And it, it, whether I'm a doctor or not, that's what I'm going to do. And it seemed that within a few days of this promise about what I was going to do in the distant future, I saw the photographs from May 2nd and 3rd, 1963, out of Birmingham in which, in the greatest risk of his entire career, Dr. King authorized small children to march into dogs and fire hoses in Birmingham. And those images went all around the world. They couldn't get more than 10 adults to go to jail the day before, but they had 600 kids go to jail the first day, and the second day they had almost 1,000 marching into dogs and fire hoses, singing the same songs that I sang in Sunday school. And I asked my mother, somewhat embarrassed, where did this come from? They're not waiting until they're 30. They're singing the same songs, and these are primarily girls. Everyone in America of authority condemned these demonstrations. Robert Kennedy said it was irresponsible and unconscionable. Malcolm X said only a coward would allow children to march in a man's war. George Wallace said it proved that Martin Luther King was depraved that he would allow this to happen. All of politics and all of the media said that these demonstrations proved that the civil rights movement had lost its moorings, and yet those photographs broke through people's emotional resistance to the civil rights movement. It f demonstrations broke out in over 700 cities forced President Kennedy to introduce the Civil Rights Bill. As never before except Passover, the fate of small children 
turn the power relations of a great nation from, from segregation to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and it was all on the witness of these school children. So my point was, where did this come from? By the time I got to college, the movement kept intensifying through Selma. I dropped my pre-med courses and started studying political science. By the time I finished Chapel Hill, I went down to work with Julian Bond. I met him in Atlanta. And we put together a challenge delegation when I was still in school to challenge Lester Maddox, our governor, at the Chicago Convention in 1968. And by a miracle, we got seated, and Julian became a lifelong friend. We had the same birthday, which we celebrated together for almost 50 years, until he, he died a couple of years ago. I miss him very sadly. One of our delegates was John Lewis, and the next summer, he hired me to work for the Voter Education Project, 1969, the first time I'd ever done anything really in civil rights except for that challenge delegation. And he sent me into South Georgia to try to register voters by myself. It was an odyssey of discovery. Columbus could not have been more lost when he sailed west than I was. <laughs> My commission, I had 20 counties where they had no connections, no, nobody on their Rolodex. They were black majority counties with practically no black registered voters. I had three days that summer in each county to visit 20 counties and see if I could find somebody capable and, and, and willing to administer a voter registration drive. And I went in basically looking for the Black Baptist Church to knock on the door and hope I discovered the next Martin Luther King. And I got thrown out by all the ministers. They said they had things well in hand, and so did the school superintendents and the morticians and everybody else. And then I had a brief period when I was trying to find the rebels like Stokely Carmichael. So I would go out to the, to the juke joints and get in poker games trying to win money. And that only got me arrested in a place called Bubba Doo's Big Apple um, <laughs> in Cuthbert, Georgia. And to make the story very short, by the end of the summer, every time I went into a new county, I went out into fields and talked to the women because the women were the only people that would tell me straight and at the end, but they would tell me straight in riddles. Like, young man, do you really believe we landed on the moon this summer? And have you seen the Simonized Wax commercial? Uh, the one where the, and I said, you know, the one where the little children float across the kitchen on an invisible shield of Simonized Wax. Uh, yes, I've seen that. And she said, do you believe that? And I said, well, I saw the moon landing on the news and the Simonized Wax is a commercial. I'm trying to explain the difference, realizing that she's asking me what, what's real and what's not about voting in Talbot County, Georgia. Um, anyway, by the end, three counties I recommended to John and he gave voter registration grants to three different projects, all headed by women who all had the same profession. I never would have guessed in a million years when I started looking for Martin Luther King, they were, they were all midwives who had a natural authority and an independence from the white economy that allowed them to escape the pervasive fear in those counties. Um, by, the, by this time, I decided th that this movement contained wonders beyond my imagination and that the only way I was going to find out where this movement had come from was to write it myself with one rule, which was not to use labels like racist and militant and this, that, and the other, because for me, we cross the boundaries of race through personal discovery that scrambles our categories that make us feel good and protected. Um, and then we can, we can reorder them. So my rule, was, my, my one rule was no, no, essays, and it killed me for a long time because I said you can't start a history of the movement that grew out of the black church without certain, um, without realities of how the, the black church culture worked. And since I couldn't write an essay, I couldn't start the book, or at least that's what I told myself. My publisher said I was just stalling. Um, I came to Memphis in 1983, still stuck. 35 years ago, 
The first time I checked into the Lorraine Motel, I got a lot of very funny looks when I said I was going to stay a week because a lot of people were staying by the hour. Um, <laughs> I see, I see Jesse. <laughs> one, one of the miracles of Memphis, and you deserve, I don't know how it happened, but I, it must have been a civic miracle that a lot of you were involved in to take the Lorraine Motel from where I saw it in 1983 to that incredible um, institution uh, worldwide. So thank you for that. They let me stay in room 308, the room next to Dr. King, but they didn't have a key to it. In fact, they said they didn't have a key to any of the rooms. When you came back, you had to go to the office and they would let you in. Um, while I was here, I was doing research and maybe some people were here from the Mississippi Valley Collection. An assortment of your ancestors and, and some of you from that long ago said, an almost biblical event happened here when Dr. King was killed. Let's gather up information, oral histories, so that other people can figure it out because it goes very deep in, in what is just and what is not uh, here in Memphis. And one of the many collections was that they went out and they got all of the film footage from the Memphis television stations. What had been on the air and what hadn't. And I went through all of this and I'm sitting there looking at an outtake of a white reporter on the night that Dr. King was killed in Memphis, in the hospital, trying to interview Ralph Abernathy. And the reporter was saying, Dr. Abernathy, Dr. Abernathy, what did you see? Did Dr. King say anything? Um, did you see the shooter? And he kept asking all these questions. And Abernathy, I think, was in shock. He didn't say a word. And the guy got frustrated. And believe it or not, I started identifying with the white reporter because I, by that time I had interviewed Ralph Abernathy several times myself and had gotten not much more out of him than this guy was getting. Uh, I got what I used to call the standard civil rights interview. Martin increased in wisdom and stature and I was his best friend. Um, and wasn't very useful. And then all of a sudden this reporter got so frustrated that he said, well, Dr. Abernathy, you can't talk what happened tonight. Can you tell me when you first met Martin Luther King? And it was like that. He snapped out of his trance and he said, young man, I first met Martin Luther King on a cold, rainy January day in 1954 when he arrived at my parsonage in the company of our prophet, our, our learned mentor, Vernon Johns. And he started telling Vernon Johns stories. And I knew who Vernon Johns was, but I didn't know very much about him. But this reporter who couldn't get Abernathy to talk at all about the assassination couldn't shut him up telling Vernon Johns stories. So I went out and said, this must be really important, and essentially wound up writing the first chapter of Parting the Waters is all about Vernon Johns. Because the next time I went to see Reverend Abernathy and asked him some Vernon Johns question, it was like putting a key in an engine. Uh, he told all of these stories. And it caused one of my first crises with the publisher. They said, this is your first chapter, are you sure? Americans do not buy big race books, certainly fat ones. The only thing you have going for you is that there's interest in Martin Luther King and you turn in this first chapter that doesn't even mention him and is about somebody that nobody's ever heard of. Uh, and I said, yes, but this tells through Vernon Johns you can feel what, how the black church worked. Uh, and he was the predecessor, and he's an amazing character. And um, so, to their credit, they let me begin with that. So, anyway, I thank Memphis for my first chapter with Vernon Johns because uh, of, of, of the experience of that white reporter. What can we say about Dr. King's shifting to history? What can we say about Dr. King's career overall? I divide Dr. King's career into two halves the reluctant ascending king from the bus boycott all the way up to the Nobel Prize. Through that period, through the sit-ins and the Freedom Rides and Ole Miss and Birmingham and Freedom Summer and St. Augustine, he was trying to get into the White House. He was in some senses like a, a conventional politician. 
but he was also reluctant. He didn't go on the freedom rides. He refused. He was very reluctant to get involved in the sit-ins. Um, all along, he, he saw himself as somebody who was impelled by his beliefs. Now, his beliefs didn't change. I, I do challenge a lot of people who think, well, who grade him like a professor and say he, his ideas changed over time. He said that his goal and the movement's goal was to redeem the soul of America from the triple scourge of bigotry, war, and poverty from the 1950s. An astonishingly audacious claim for a movement of a largely invisible people who had access to no traditional political weapons. They didn't want to just free themselves, they wanted to free the whole world. And not just of race, but of poverty and war to boot. Because he said they were inextricably related. Violence of the flesh and violence of the spirit. That was his goal. Through this reluctant time going up, he would behave like a traditional politician. From the time of the note, from 64 on, he became driven. Because what happened, it, in short, the way he described it, is that America, the movement convinced America to abandon legal segregation, that it was too much not to allow even black children to go into public libraries and to sit on the back of the bus. But at that same time, the poll said the black movement is going too far too fast, and, and we resent it. And Dr. King became driven to show that this framework that he had about how far we were from ending violence of the flesh and violence of the spirit had to take that message farther. And he dragged the staff north into Chicago to prove that race was not and never had been just about the South. And, and he exposed hatred on the streets of Chicago, as no one knows better than Jesse Jackson, uh, just see out here in the audience, than anyone else. Then he dragged the staff that was voted unanimously, except for Jim Bevel, not for him not to denounce the Vietnam War. He did it anyway. They said Bevel's crazy. Dr. King said, it's the cracked ones that let the light in. Um, and I have to do this. And his, not only civil rights, but the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the whole world rejected him without even considering the substance of what he said about war. Then he, then he dragged the staff into the Poor People's Campaign with a plan. It's often forgotten. The plan for the Poor People's Campaign was modeled on the bonus marchers from World War I who were starving and went to Washington in 1932 and were driven out by the U.S. Army led by General Patton, who was then a colonel, um, and MacArthur on horseback, beaten, people killed. But Dr. King said they didn't succeed, but they did start etching into the political consciousness of the people there in Washington who saw it and felt guilty something about obligations to poor and starving people and when they petitioned that helped lead to the GI Bill 12 years later. And he said, we may not succeed when we go to Washington with a poor people's campaign, but one day America will wake up. We're making a witness. We're leaving a witness. He told the staff in one of the meetings, we have to finish on what we have left, even if it's next to nothing, quoting the book of Revelation. He was leaving a witness about the completeness of his vision of what's at stake in race relations. And then, for, even from the Poor People's Campaign, he was diverted into Memphis. Now, he was diverted into Memphis because of your stormy weather. You've always had stormy weather. <laughs> um, and on February 1st, 1968, you had tornadoes and gully washers, and the attention of not only Memphis, but the whole country was whether or not Elvis would be safe getting across town for Priscilla to deliver her baby, okay? February 1st, 1968. But that same day, the sanitation trucks in Memphis were going through the neighborhoods under strict rules that they were not, no matter what the weather was, to seek shelter in the neighborhoods of Memphis because nobody wanted to be bothered with them. Willie Crane was a driver. They had three tub men on each, car, on each truck. They were cylindrical, old-fashioned trucks. There was room for one tub man and the driver and when the rain got really terrible, the only place the other two tub men could go was through the slit just behind the cab with the garbage. 
and a broom fell on the lever and it compacted Echo Cole and Robert Walker in the back of a garbage truck. One witness saw legs, a leg trying to uh, struggle to get out. Two men with names were crushed with the garbage. This is the background of the slogan, I am a man. I am a man, not like Echo Cole and Robert Walker it was in, in their memory, um, not like a piece of garbage, that this strike began. It's important to remember that because when King came here, he said, I'm coming because nothing can better personify the goals of the Poor People's Campaign than what has happened here in Memphis. Plus, Jim Lawson was here, one of his running the campaign. So he, he wanted to come. So that's why he came here in, in 1968. And, and the message has gone he was driven to finish on what he had left when he said, here, I may not get there with you, but we as a people will get to the promised land. Since then, we've had a country that's been stalled between liberation and gridlock because we lost track of that message, in my view. And we're lucky enough to think about the witnesses that we have. 200 years ago, Frederick Douglass was born. 50 years ago, Dr. King was killed in this city. Frederick Douglass said after the Civil War that the South repackaged its hatred of the Yankees from the Civil War and directed it toward the freedmen to disestablish the 14th Amendment that was born largely right here in Memphis from the riots of 1866 and set aside the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, and even parts of the 13th Amendment forbidding slavery. That we went backwards. We repackaged the hostility to the Yankees into a hostility to the freedmen. Dr. King said that what happened at the end of his career was that America had repackaged the resentment, the overt resentment of segregation and segregationist politicians into a resentment of the federal government that was sponsoring diversity and civil rights laws. And, and hostility to government became the prevailing theme in politics. He said George Wallace has revised his stump speech into minor little classics that never mention race and say that his only goal is to restore the role of local government from pointy-headed bureaucrats, tyrannical judges, and tax and spend liberals. He invented the vocabulary of modern politics. And we turned away from the message of Dr. King for largely 50 years into gridlock. It's happened before. My thesis is that race is and always has been freedom's gate in America, that it can swing open when we make it swing open, and that it can swing close when we let it swing close. But it's always at the center, but we tend to bounce off of race to get onto other topics and lose the wonder of it and, and, and the, potent, the nuclear potential in the associations that come across racial uh, barriers. Now we're in another period of stirring from women of color and dreamers and women not of color and Black Lives Matter people and high school students upset by the culture of guns to try to influence us the way the kids did in Birmingham in 1963, the dogs and fire hoses. To me, it's kind of like the 1950s when there was a lot of percolation going on. And Dr. King was the first and only civil rights leader to say that the sit-ins were a breakthrough when other people were saying it's a panty raid. The sit-ins are a breakthrough from the start, he said, because there are certain elements of human nature that are so stubborn that words alone are not enough and you have to amplify with sacrifice and these college students have found a way to make witness against segregation with sacrifice and this is a breakthrough. We're waiting to see if something else like that can come along again. Um, I hope it can. I want to leave to you three areas that I think are worthwhile for debate and signal posts as to whether or not 
this stirring of age can coalesce in another period of freedom's gate swinging open, as I hope it, as I hope it will. We're caught in a great paradox that the black-led civil rights movement has opened freedom's gate inexorably for lots of other people. Um, for women who couldn't go to the University of North Carolina when I was there, unless they were nursing students, couldn't serve on juries, for seniors, for the disabled, for gays and lesbians, things far beyond the imagination of most of the people in the civil rights movement at the time. And instead of Armageddon, nuclear war, the Soviet Union dissolved with people singing We Shall Overcome as they took down the Berlin Wall and in Prague. And apartheid dissolved with Nelson Mandela. We have all these miracles and yet we're trapped in cynicism because I think we have all succumbed to the anti, to the cynical politics that resented the politics that produced the civil rights movement. And it's up to us to get out of it. I think there are, I want to mention three areas of fierce debate, because you're never going to be able to recapture the civil rights movement. You can't fight the next movement by the last movement's uh, rules, but you need to look at them too. I th um, I think there's room for healthy debate about leadership and styles of leadership. Dr. King was prophetic leadership. He was the standard leader. He put one foot in the Constitution, one foot in the Scriptures, equal souls, equal votes. Either way, it points toward equal citizenship if you believe about your sacred heritage or your civil, civic heritage. It was a remarkable balance in his rhetoric. But there were a lot of students who said, look, he's a traditional leader. He's, ju he's just saying, follow me. And we want grassroots leadership. We want people to go out. He's getting all the publicity. We want to go out and serve. Bob Moses, uh, Freedom Summer uh, should be a lot better uh, known. Um, the issues are profound. They, it requires study, it requires thought, but it also requires sacrifice. My own point of view is that you need every kind of leadership you can get, and beyond leadership, you need every citizen to think that it's the citizen's duty to be leaders. Um, that's kind of connected to grassroots. But we're beginning... I think it's a healthy sign in our stirring that we're beginning to have debates about what kind of leadership is most necessary and who's responsible or not and people saying whether or not these high school kids uh, can be seriously of course they can um, in, in, in America everybody's leadership rests on what they're doing and the element of surprise and the element of maturity and the element of optimism is all on their side the second issue that I think we need to bear in mind is the issue of violence versus nonviolence this is, a, this is a hard issue whenever I mention it because I think people tend to bounce off nonviolence the same way they tend to bounce off race. To find some safe ground to say, I'm not a bad person, I'm not a racist, um, or uh, uh, some safe place to say there is a case for violence here or there. I have to put in at this point a, a shameless plug. I, I had a pre, uh, premiere last night of a movie on HBO King in the Wilderness, I'm executive producer, um, and some of the most poignant scenes in that, it, it's only been on once, so if you missed it, it'll be back. Um, it's the first, been trying for 30 years to get something about the movement on the, on the screen, this is the first one. Some of the most poignant scenes are, are Dr. King debating Stokely Carmichael as they walk along the streets of Mississippi during the Meredith March in 1966 about the merits of violence and nonviolence. And Stokely saying what he told me afterwards, not all of this is on the film, but um, uh, why do we have to be nonviolent? How come America admires nonviolence only in black people? But otherwise it admires John Wayne and, and James Bond. Um, it's not fair. Why should we have, I've been to jail 37 times, he said, for six years. Uh, I have, you know, I'm like a soldier. Uh, why do I have to keep inviting violence against me to get white America to do what it should have done in the first place. And Dr. King said, Stokely, you're right. It isn't fair. Nobody has a right to impose nonviolence on anybody else. All I'm trying to get you to see is that nonviolence is a leadership doctrine. We're ahead of where white America is. If we step up to violence, we're going back where they are. Um, and 
quite apart from the political and, and practical issues of whether or not you can win nonviolence uh, as a minority, uh, a largely unarmed minority, in the morality of it, nonviolence is a leadership doctrine and it cannot, we must rise above the stigma, stigmatizing of nonviolence as something that's for the weak. And I can, I'm telling you, we didn't get past that. Dr. King did not win that argument. Stokely was too sexy, um, among other things. And the black power um, uh, became uh, the rage. And I can tell you to this day, one of the secrets, I know a lot of veterans of the nonviolent civil rights movement who were nonviolent who deny that they're nonviolent today, as being embarrassed by it. Um, not a lot. I, I know some. And I, I just mention that because it's so shocking that people equate violence with strength. And that is a question that deserves profound thought, not just your knee-jerk answer. Dr. King went all the way to India to try to find out about nonviolence in 1959 and whether he could make it work. And he came back fairly disillusioned. He said, first of all, the leading opponent of nonviolence, Nehru, Nehru, proponent, is building an atomic bomb. <laughs> the rest of the, of the Gandhian nonviolence people have split into a thousand factions, some of whom step over insects and some of whom fast all the time. He said, we can't have fasts in the, in the American Civil Rights Movement because those Indians haven't had barbecue. And <laughs> we're not going to fast that much. Besides, we're a minority. We have to invent our own form of nonviolence in the United States. But the point is, he said that nonviolence is not an esoteric weird thing for vegetarians and Gandhians. Nonviolence is the essence of democracy because democracy is about votes. Every four years we have a festival of votes called an election. Whereas in other countries like Syria they have a festival of bloodbath. Votes are power. In the Pentagon, if you go to the National War College, they're the only people that take nonviolence seriously in my view. Um, from a theoretical point of view, they say history's trend is that since Napoleon industrialized war, violence, military violence destroys more and governs less. And that in an interdependent world, over the long run, power grows against the grain of violence. If we had civil wars instead of elections in 2020, would our country be more powerful or less powerful? These are profound questions that I think college colleges ought to be debating. Violence is one of the most salient topics there is. We're now moved to the place where we're addressing violence even among spouses and partners and in the workplace. And yet we don't have theoretical discussions about the potential of nonviolence to be the advance guard of, of, of civic relations among us, of, of votes. What a vote is, it's the, it's the greatest invention in nonviolence there ever was. And, and Dr. King talked about it and he said, quite apart from the fact that, that Jesus went to the cross to show that there was life beyond death through nonviolence, uh, a witness against violence, and that we now measure time divided into AD and BC by that witness, quite apart from that, in our civic um, our civic creed, nonviolence is at the heart. So I commend people need to think more about nonviolence as a conscious strategy, not only for a movement, but for our country and around the world, how we make witness for democracy. <laughs> Finally, I want to say the third area that's, that, that's, that's hard is, is the area of optimism and cynicism itself. What is the role, where did the optimism of the civil rights movement come from and what is the role of optimism in a cynical age? Put another way, how did we get to be cynical? Why is it that everybody just will say we're in a cynical age and you hardly ever hear anybody say how did we get here and how do we get out of it? Um, what are the elements of cynicism? Where it I, I suggest that cynicism is not a judgment, that it's an appetite. It's an appetite to have a negative answer. And we 
the people on the civil rights side of this issue are vulnerable to that too. We can be cynical about the promise of government. I've interviewed an awful lot of FBI agents, including the ones that persecuted Dr. King, the ones that ran his wiretap, the wiretap on him. I yield to no one in an appreciation of the, uh, of the insidious culture of the FBI in, in persecuting Dr. King. And yet, I hesitate when people say that they must have ordered the hit themselves and it must have come out of the federal government. And these are sensitive, these are sensitive issues, but I think they, they go to the heart of what message we can hope to offer if we think that the promise of America, of America is poisoned by inherent evil that cannot be escaped and cannot be risen above. Some of Dr. King's most poignant sermons were saying, where did the vitality of the, sla of the black culture in America come from? How did they take the question of Jeremiah in a time of mourning, in biblical time, is there a bomb, in, is there no bomb in Gilead? And turn it around, and he said, stretch that question mark out into an exclamation point, there is a bomb in Gilead. The bottomless vitality and optimism of slaves in the heart of slavery can create that spiritual. How can we in the 21st century, with all the liberation that is let loose, believe that our experiment in democracy is fatally poisoned and that we can't offer hope from our political traditions? Do not let us become a mirror contributor to cynicism by saying that our government is fatally poisoned against justice. Because that's what you get 50 years ago tonight with Dr. King saying, you know, we will get to the promised land. Mine eyes have seen the glory. He was not a Pollyanna. He knew as well as anyone the depth of what he was struggling against because he had just made witness uh, for those last three years knowing that he was not capturing America, that America was in that, that revolt that Frederick Douglass had complained about a hundred years before. But nevertheless, he offered optimism every single time. I think that's the most distinctive thing about Dr. King is the timbre of his voice. You hear the struggle between realism and hope in his voice, and it comes out as a hymn for hope uh, every time. And I think that we have to be careful to do that too, to figure out ways to offer optimism in this time of stirring so that we too have a chance um, to, to, to take the legacy of equal souls, equal votes uh, forward again. My uh, Bob Moses, I, we, I give speeches occasionally with Bob Moses, and he does every one of them. He says, I wish every candidate, every debate would begin simply by recapturing the astonishing, breathtaking audacity and optimism of our form of government and every citizen's responsibility simply by reciting the first sentence in the, pro in the Constitution. It's very easy, but when you think what's piled up there from 1787, it's pretty breathtaking. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure de domestic tra tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. That's an, op that's an optimism that falls on every citizen. And nobody lived, it up, lived up to it better than the, the, the movement people in the civil rights era, including Jesse and many, many other heroes who are here uh, tonight. Uh, to me, as a white Southerner uh, who studied this movement now for 35 years, I think there's no greater miracle than that a people who had been denied anything but the whiplash of our professions of liberty nevertheless had the political genius and the, and the indescribable courage to lift the rest of us toward the meaning of our own professed values. <laughs> Dr. King left the legacy even after he died. It was published 
in Look Magazine, he wrote it just before he came to Memphis. It was published after his funeral, in which he said, the American people are infected with racism. That is the problem. The American people are also infected with democratic idealism. There is our hope. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Branch. That was wonderful. Um, we are going to have a book signing with Taylor Branch over at the Rose Theater, outside of the Rose Theater, for the next 30 minutes. So if anybody would like to get a book signed by Mr. Branch, please do join us. But also, we have one more uh, panel for our symposium, The Promise of Education. And so we hope that you will join us over at the Rose Theater for that final uh, symposium panel. I was listening to uh, Mr. Branch and he said the word percolation. Do any of you all remember, I'm, I'm kind of old, you all remember a percolator that used to make coffee, you know? You know, you, I remember seeing my grandmother's percolator on the stove and you'd see the little brown liquid come up, start bubbling up. If we could all be more like a percolator, and as it rolls and rumbles, we begin to pop up, and we get stronger, and we get stronger, and we get stronger, until you have to pour it out of the pot and do something else with it, drink it. I would ask all of us to think about what our role is. This entire commemoration is not about what happened 50 years ago as much as it is about what we must do today to carry out the legacy as left 50 years ago. Thank you for being with us this afternoon and please join us at the book signing and at the last symposium panel.